We're gathered in the name of Jesus Christ to give him honor and praise and thanks for all that he has done for us in this season of Advent, anticipating Christmas. We remember all that he gave up so that he could join us and be one of us so that we could be saved. Um, Just for a couple, just to announce uh, our offerings on, uh, that we'll collect on our way out. First is for the general fund, and that goes to everything that we do here. The second is for faith promise, and that goes to our missionaries and our, our outreach efforts. So I wanted to mention that. Um, but let's, uh, this is the Sunday of Advent where we talk about peace, and we think about how Christ has brought us peace. And so our call to worship comes from Isaiah 9 today. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We have a lot to give thanks for and a lot to worship our God for. Why don't you stand? God will greet us. We come to God's presence and he greets us today. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all respond by saying, Amen. Amen. And uh, we, are, we made a change to our opening song. We're going to sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You, followed by Joy to the World, Celebration 271 and 270, words on the screen. Let's sing together.
be seated. Today we light the candle of peace. There's an old Latin proverb that says, if you want peace, prepare for war. The story of Rahab, the second woman in Matthew's genealogy, gives us that ancient adage of unique twist. Unlike Tamar before her, Rahab was an actual prostitute, not just pretending to be one. She lived in the doomed city of Jericho, destined to be overrun and destroyed by the armies of Israel. He came, he came and, and preached peace to you who were, who were far, far off, off and peace to those who were near. Recognizing the God of Israel as the one true sovereign of heaven and earth, Rahab made a separate peace with the people of Israel and with their God. She sheltered the Israelite spies during the reconnaissance mission and helped them escape, asking that she and her family be spared in return. As a public token of her new allegiance, she hung a scarlet cord out the window of her house in plain view of her own people, so that everyone within her house would be spared by the advancing armies. He, he shall speak, speak peace, peace to, the to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and, and from, from the, the river to the ends of the earth. To an outside observer, everything would have seemed to be against Rahab. Not only was she a prostitute, but also a Canaanite, the member of a people group marked by God for wholesale judgment. And yet, not only did she save herself and her family, but she joined the faith community of Israel married into the royal tribe of Judah and became the mother of Boaz and the notable ancestor of Jesus. Her place in the Lord's lineage is a powerful reminder that even in the face of uncertain judgment, peace with God is available through faith in the coming Christ. We light the candle of peace as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Jesus gives us hope. That was the first Sunday of Advent. He gives us peace, particularly peace with God, even though we were sinners. We're going to go into our time of prayer now. We're going to pray to God all together as a congregation. Um, one thing to, to mention, um, it says on our prayer sheet that Doug Beist is undergoing tests on his throat. Um, a big day for him is going to be Wednesday, so uh, we'll be special in prayer for him um, on that day. Uh, but let's bow our heads. Let's pray to God together as a congregation. Our God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise to you as our God. You are the one, Lord, who holds all things in place. And Lord, you've given us all that we get to enjoy. Lord, you are the one who deserves all the praise and all the thanks, especially, Lord, for sending your Son. And Lord, we want to recognize that even as you have restored uh, peace between us and you, uh, Lord, we often do not carry that peace with us. Lord, instead, we, we try to earn our righteousness before you. Or Lord, we, we do not carry the, the peace between you and us. And we, we bring uh, conflict and strife to others. Lord, we allow conflict and strife to, to reign in our own hearts even. So, Lord, we, we want to confess this before you. We want to be people of peace, the peace that you have given to us. We want that to rule in our hearts, and we pray that you would renew our hearts, our lives, so that we can be, Lord, the people that you call us to be. Lord Jesus, in this season, we remember all that you have given up so that we could be saved. You left aside a, a heavenly throne and eternal glory to be one of us, to be born in a barn among animals and to be laid in a feeding trough just to, just to save us. So Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise this day because you are our Savior and you came to be one of us. Lord, we pray that in this season we would recognize you for who you are and give you thanks and appreciation. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us in addition to our salvation. We have many good things to enjoy in this life. We have lots of our needs met, lots of our wants, 
lots of securities and enjoyments that we get to have. Lord, there's many good things that we have all because of you. And Lord, we easily take these for granted. We easily attribute them to our own talents, goodness, intelligence, strength, whatever. Uh, but Lord, they really come from you. So thank you, Lord, for always providing for us and giving us much that we can enjoy. Lord, we want to say thank you for the, the family, the friends, the loved ones that you put in our lives. Uh, Lord, these are, these are maybe the greatest gifts aside from your salvation. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for the, the good people that you put around us who help us, support us, encourage us, and are there for us in times of need. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, as we experience love between ourselves, we would remember your love for us. We want to say thank you today for Harv Driesinga and the 84 years you've given to him. Uh, Lord, thank you for him, and uh, especially with this past year of, of lots of health difficulties. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for his life. Uh, Lord, uh, continue to show your faithfulness to him. We give you thanks also that Hank Klinger is able to be home now, and uh, Lord, that was a prayer that uh, he and us have been lifting up to you for a while, so thank you, Lord, that that, that has been answered. Lord, we pray that uh, he would continue to grow in, in strength as well. We're going to take a moment, Lord, a silent moment to lay our cares and concerns before you, maybe people that we are concerned about. Uh, Lord, please hear us as we lift these up to you now. Lord, we, as we lift these things to you, we, we recognize that you don't always answer us as we would like, and yet, Lord, we lay these requests and cares and concerns before you, knowing that you are a good God, and if, Lord, you are not going to give us what, what we ask for, we can have confidence that you have other things going on, and uh, Lord, no matter what happens, we can be patient when things go against us and thankful when things go well. And we pray, Lord, that our eyes would be focused on you and who you are, no matter what we are facing in this life. We pray for your peace, Lord, in times of anxiety especially. We pray that, uh, Lord, we would have peace in our hearts and our lives and in this congregation. We pray, Lord, that our counsel would be led according to your peace by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for Deb Van Houten, that she would continue to gain strength, that she would recover, and that there would be improvements so that she can be encouraged. We pray for Doug Bice, Lord, um, we especially for him on, on Wednesday. We, we pray for him that uh, all would go well for him, that there would be uh, good news, good results, and Lord, that there would be swift recovery. Uh, please give him encouragement. We pray for Don Klosterhaus. He has uh, important surgery on Wednesday, too. We pray for him that all would go well for him. We pray that there would be success and, uh, Lord, that the doctors would have uh, the right wisdom and, and observance of what needs to happen. Uh, Lord, give Don encouragement this week and uh, quick recovery. Be with Bob Reitman as well as Deb. We pray, Lord, that as he undergoes tests and there are decisions to make, we pray that your wisdom would lead and guide them. Lord, we pray for Amy DeCrater. Lord, we pray that uh, sh she would have your confidence with her, your peace with her and her family. Lord, that you would encourage them and lift them all up. Lord, there's lots of people that we uh, also lift up to you today. We've lifted up Bob. We also lift up B and Jim, Jonathan, Art, and Harv, Kyle, Dakota, Nick, Ashlyn, Bev, and Leona. Please take care of each of them, Lord, each according to their needs. Please build them up and encourage them and give them strong faith to meet the challenges they face. Lord, we are thankful for B. Hobman, that she is a part of our church. We pray that we would always be a blessing to her and she always to us. 
We pray for Brenda Vandersher, that as she serves you in West Africa, that, that uh, your word would go forth from her, that your gospel would be, would be known and preached, and Lord, that uh, people would know Jesus as Lord and Savior through her work. Lord, we pray that this time of worship would be pleasing to you. We pray that our hearts would be in our worship, that you would be honored, and that in turn we would be edified. And Lord, uh, that this would be a time of, of uh, renewing our faith and in our love for you and in our strengthening in our walk with you. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would always bless, lead, and guide this church and each one of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing now of the Father's love begotten. It's a song that talks about Advent and anticipating Jesus and and who he is and what his coming means. There's three verses from Celebration Hymnal 240 and kids aged three years old through kindergarten can head downstairs for children and worship. Let's stand and sing together. be seated. So in the the season of Advent, we are focusing on Jesus and and who he is, and we're looking at the times in the Old Testament when the Son of God, before he was known to us as Jesus, appeared to different people in the Old Testament. So to, uh, to start, let's go through this memory verse that we're, we're trying to learn. It's uh, on the screen here. Let's say it, and then we'll take it away and say it as best we can without it on the screen. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John 1.18. All right. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. John 1, 18. Got a couple more weeks to learn that, and we will learn it eventually here. Exodus 34 is what we're going to look at today. We're going to read verses 1 through 9 and 25 through 38. Let's ask for uh, the Holy Spirit to lead us as we reflect and study his word. Um, Father in heaven, please uh, send us your Holy Spirit so that as we, we read, as we reflect, and as we 
dwell on what you have said to us through these words, that uh, you would speak to each one of us through the words that I've prepared, and that you would strengthen and encourage us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Exodus 34, starting at verse 1 here. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all of the mountain. Let no flocks or herds grade opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and part in our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And now going to verse 28 there. So he was there, that's Moses, there with the Lord, 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. So that's Exodus 34 there. So, as I've done in a couple uh, weeks, weeks past, the, this is and others are what you would call a theophany, which means uh, when the Lord appears in the Old Testament. And whenever that happens, it's always the Son of God before he came incarnate in Jesus. So, we might think, and I think a lot of people did think until Jesus came, that this was God the Father that appeared. But the New Testament makes pretty clear that nobody has ever seen the Father ever at all. And that if anybody, anything that we do know about the Father, it's, it's through the Son. And so that means everything, every time that God appeared in the Old Testament, it was actually the Son all along that was appearing. And so as we celebrate the coming of Christ... We remember the times in which it turns out that he had appeared even before he became known as Jesus Christ. So when, when you say Jesus, that's the person born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, but the Son of God, he's, he's eternal. And so he was around before Jesus was. Just a little background to this story. Um, you know, I, ideally we could... We could read long sections and give better context to all of the stories that we have here, but 
we only have a limited amount of time, but just before what we read today, um, some of you know this story, the people made a golden calf to worship it. This was right after they received the Ten Commandments, and as you know, it, no other gods before me and no images. Well, what do the people do shortly after that? They make an image. And so the people make a golden calf. Moses goes up and makes intercession for the people. And while he's doing that, he's talking with God. And Moses almost kind of uh, quite forwardly says, please show me your glory. And God says, basically, okay, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name. But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. In other words, you can't survive this. So I'm going I'm to give you just what you can handle, nothing, nothing more. And then Exodus 34 is when God did appear to him like that. So some things I want you to, know, I want you to notice in what we read here. In verse 3, only Moses could go up to meet the Lord. Just Moses. In fact, verse 3, is very, God is very clear Nobody else is to come. In fact, nobody else should even be nearby. No animals should even be nearby. It just has to be you. Everybody else has to keep their distance. There's there's some pretty specific instructions that not even animals can can come near. Only just you. This This is really important. So only Moses could go up and could be in the presence of of the Lord. There's significance to that. I'll talk about that in a little bit. In verses 6 through 7, it says, God proclaimed the name of the Lord, which might seem a little a little awkward, but God the Lord declares his name to be both merciful and just. And this is the first time of many times in the Old Testament where God is said to be this. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's repeated a lot in the Old Testament. This is kind of a standard explanation for who God is. God is, he's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. So we can, we can have reassurance and confidence in that. This appears many times. But something to notice here that is not on the screen, but only God can tell us who he is. We, we have a, a way as human beings, I sense it in myself, I, I sense it in the way that people talk about God. We like to have our own ideas of God and we put that on him. I feel that God is, you know, or I think God is. And really, that's, that's very backwards. God tells us who he is. This is who I am. You can accept me for who I am, take me or leave me, whatever you want, but this is who I am. You know, we, we kind of, this is who I am, take me or leave me, you know. We kind of have that way. God, God is a little bit that way too. He tells us who he is. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. If you're going to walk with me, this is what I expect. Take it or leave it. But only God can say who he is. We can't make it up. And then in verse 8, it says, Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. Quickly. It was really fast. And he's afraid here in God's presence, but he also worships. There's There's kind of two things going on there. And I think this is a, this is a pretty good uh, explanation of what it's like to be in the presence of God. You're overwhelmed, first of all, by how big God is, how powerful he is, and how amazing he is. And it's, it's almost terrifying. It's so overwhelming. And yet, at the same time, it's not just terrifying and magnificent, but it's, it's delightful it's, it's something that you, you just want, you, you crave. It, it, makes, it makes you, you fire on all cylinders. This is, this is wonderful. 
And so you're, you're, you're afraid and, and terrified, and yet it's so wonderful too. And so Moses is afraid, but he also worships. There's fear and delight here together. Peter, James, and John have a similar reaction when Jesus says transfigured. There was one time when Jesus let all of his glory be shown. And he took Peter, James, and John, and he went up a mountain, and Jesus was transfigured, and Moses and Elijah appeared on either side of him. And it said his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as bright as the light. And they, the disciples, they hit the ground when that happened. Now God's description of himself kind of should give a certain kind of response from us. When God says to us, to Moses and to us, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. So there's, there's, some, there's different things going on here. So God's description of himself brings us both comfort and caution here. There's, there's a lot that comforts us right at the beginning. And most of what he says is comforting and reassuring. God's, God's loving. He's forgiving. He takes a long time for him to, to get angry. He's very patient. But if you completely disregard him and forget about him and just say, you know, whatever, God, I don't care about you, uh, there will be consequences. So there's comfort and caution in God's presence, not unlike fear and, and delight. You have grace and mercy that's very emphasized, but there is a warning there that sin does get punished. God is not our doormat. He has his boundaries, and if you cross those boundaries, there will be consequences, but he is very forgiving and he is very patient. And that's a wonderful thing to know. If you, especially back then, but even in some places today, if you worshipped pagan gods, the pagan gods are very fickle. You have to try to somehow placate them and try to make sacrifices to them and go through these superstitious rituals that supposedly please them, but, but they can strike at any minute. They can, they, it's really hard to know what they are really after. And here's God saying, I'm, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, I forgive. It takes me a long time to get angry. In verse 28, I wanted to make sure I include verse 28 because I thought that was, that was interesting, even though it's out of that, that section there. Moses does not eat or drink for 40 days. That's humanly impossible. 40 days with no eating or drinking at all. So I, I, I decided to look this up, okay? Because no eating for 40 days, yeah, you can probably get away with that. But no drinking for 40 days? No. That, that is not humanly possible. Uh, the longest someone is known to have gone without water was um, a guy who was an Aus Austrian bricklayer who was 18 years old. He was left locked in a police cell for 18 days in 1979 after the officers on duty forgot about him. 18 days he went without drinking. That's the record. 18 days. That's not even half of what Moses went. This is humanly impossible. So there's something, there's something about this here that we're supposed to pick up on. As a matter of fact, I'm a little thirsty right now. This is humanly impossible to go without liquids that much. And I'll get to what we can take away from that in a little bit here. But then in verse 29 and then the rest of the, the passage that we read there, Moses' face shines after being with the Lord. His, his face shines. And 
it's kind of hard to imagine what that's like, but everybody was really terrified of him. So I'm imagining it's maybe something like, like this, you know? If you're sitting around a campfire and you're telling a scary story or something like that, this is kind of what you do because it kind of gives that spooky feeling and stuff. And uh, it's, it's kind of, it kind of gives that, you know, there's, there's, your face is shining, but it's kind of in a spooky way. I, I don't know if this is exactly what it was like or not, but it definitely scared everybody. It didn't scare half of them, it scared all of them. So Moses' face shone when he came down after being with God, and it was kind of scary. Everybody was like, what is going on here? So Moses' face shone, and he had to put a veil over his face because people were just, they couldn't handle it. Okay, so what does this story tell us about Jesus? What do, what do we know about Jesus from, from this story? Well, only Moses could approach. Just Moses. Nobody else, nobody else can even come near. No animals even. Stay away. Only the Son of God can approach the Father. Only the Son of God. None of us can. All the verses that I put up a little bit ago, they say nobody has seen the Father. Nobody can see Him. He dwells in unapproachable light. Nobody has seen the Father, ever. Jesus in John 6, 46, He says, Not that anyone has seen the Father except He who is from God. He has seen the Father. So there, there is this only one person can go. Our memory verse talks about this too. There's some specialness and some sacredness here. Not just anybody. This is, a, this is a special thing. This is a privilege. And so what we can get from that is that only in Jesus can we approach the Father. Without Jesus, we have no access to the Father at all. We have no audience with him. We have no, there's no reason God should listen to us or pay any attention to us at all. And we have no access to him, really. So, the Son of God, before Jesus, he had full glory. And sinful humans can't survive it. He can't, can't survive it. And so, the Son of God which we celebrate in this season, he, he gave up all of that glory, all of that, all that privilege, and then he became one of us so that we can access him. Any one of us now can access him, and because he can go before the Father at any time, we can access the Father now. So maybe a little difficult for us to understand, but there's some sacredness here that is being reflected in that only Moses can go. So only Jesus can approach the Father. Only through Him can we approach the Father. It says in Ephesians 2.18, there through Him, that's Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Approaching the Father is a big deal. And we can only do it because of Jesus. When God declared his name, which is kind of like his, his reputation, who he is, a person's name, especially in the Old Testament, is kind of a description of who they are. So when God declares his name, it was, I'm a God of mercy, and I'm also a God of justice. I'm both. Not one without the other. And in Jesus himself, Jesus himself is God's mercy and justice to us. There is mercy in just who Jesus is. The very fact that Jesus came to us is God showing us mercy. Because without, without him having this kind of access to just another human being, we wouldn't have, be able to access God or any of that heavenly glory at all. So Jesus put that aside so that he could be one of us, and now we can access him. Just like you and I, we 
can talk together face to face. We can talk with Jesus face to face. Sure, you know, we can access that. We can, we can handle that. We can't handle his full heavenly glory, at least not in our sinful self. But we can access a baby in a manger and a guy from Nazareth who goes around teaching and, and healing people. So Jesus is God's mercy and his justice. He's merciful and in the cross we see God's justice. God's justice in paying for our sins and demonstrating what the punishment of sin really is. There's justice there. We talk about that more during the season of Lent. Okay, Moses ate nothing when in God's presence. Ate nothing, drank nothing, humanly impossible, right? 40 days with nothing. I don't recommend you give that a try. But what we can learn from this is that the Lord's presence, with all of his glory, gives us everything that we need. All of our needs are met just by being there and being surrounded in his glory. All of our needs are met, all of them, including the food and drink that our bodies require. I think that's really fascinating. When you're just in his presence, you have everything that you need, body and soul. And there's a reason why Jesus compared himself to bread and water. So it's on the screen there. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Okay, and there's, there's a lot of symbolism there, but there's some literalism there too. If you are in his presence, in his fullness of his glory, you will want for nothing at all, ever. And that is how wonderful heaven is. Because he is the source of life itself. And when you are just in his presence, you will live forever. Doesn't matter if you eat anything or drink anything, who cares? If you're in the presence of the source of life, you will be alive. And not just alive, but you will have the fullness of life. Everything that you need for body and soul. He is everything that you are looking for. So in the Lord, we want for nothing. Nothing at all. He provides, even just even you and I to now, today, even though we don't have his immediate presence and the fullness of his glory right here and now, even still, he provides our food, our drink, and our shelter. He takes care of us. There's a reason we say, give us this day our daily bread. It comes from him. And he provides what our hearts desire, too. It comes from him. He doesn't, he doesn't spoil us. He doesn't give us absolutely everything that we ask for all the time. No good parents do that. But he gives us a lot of things to enjoy. And so there's, there's a lesson here. In, in the Lord that we want for nothing. And, and I'm, I'm very thoroughly convinced that he himself is everything that we're looking for out of life. There's nothing that we could seek here and now that is better or more fulfilling or more meaningful or more true than he himself. And so there's a lesson here, I think. When we sin, when we go against him, Sin is seeking good things on our terms, apart from God. That's what sin is. We're chasing something good, something that's meant to be met through Him, and we're chasing it here and now on, in our ways, on our terms, on our time. Saying, God, I want the good things that you offer, but I want it now. I want it this way. And I want it here. We're getting it our way on our schedule. So, for example, Adam and Eve in the garden. Most of you are familiar with this story. The serpent comes and tempts Eve. 
and with this fruit, and he says, you know what, if you eat this fruit, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Wouldn't you like that? And Eve kind of kind of does. Now, becoming like God is not evil in itself. In fact, we're called to be like God. We're challenged to do that. We're supposed to do that. Be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. And uh, uh, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, Jesus says. We're supposed to be like God. That's not a bad thing. But how that is achieved, that was what was bad. Satan says, yeah, if you eat this fruit and you disobey God, you can have it now. Right now. On your terms. Wouldn't you like that? A couple other, some other sins. Making images for God. This, this comes from a, a understandable desire to want to know God and understand God. We want to put him in this box so that we can understand who he is and make this image of him so God is like a golden calf. Okay, now we can understand God. It's not wrong to want to know and understand God, but it is wrong to say this is who you are, God. That's wrong. Or Sabbath, for example. The Sabbath is made for us, Jesus said. And misusing a Sabbath is really a misused desire to achieve and to accomplish. It's not wrong to want to work. It's not wrong to want to achieve. But if you are taking every single day of your week to do it, then it's an inordinate desire. You're putting it before the Lord. Murder. That's a misused desire for justice. People murder, most of the time anyways, because they want justice, but they want it on their terms. Adultery is a misused desire for intimacy. We all want to know and to be known, and, but we want the adultery is, I want it my way. Stealing is a misused desire for dominion. We, have, we are created to work the garden and to take care of it, to have this dominion, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. But if we ourselves, we don't have enough dominion or we feel like we're out of control, we have to take some stuff. Every, every sin that we commit is Satan basically holding out, wouldn't you want the good things of God without having to go through all of his requirements? You can take this shortcut here. You can have this on your terms apart from God. You don't need God to have good things. That's what sin is. And if, if we can actually pay attention to what's going on in ourselves and around ourselves, God is saying, I, I'm offering you here everything that you want out of life. All of it. Everything. You will want for nothing if you come towards me and you follow me. I will give you everything that you want. But you do need to be patient. And you do need to do it this way. If you don't do it this way, it will be bad. Whenever I feel tempted about anything, this, I think about this. And it helps. It helps me realize God wants to give me everything that I want. And I just have to be patient. I just have to wait on him. And I just have to be obedient. And he will give me everything that I'm looking for. Look at the screen here. This will go with our next point. Doesn't this teaching of salvation by grace make people indifferent and wicked? No, it is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. It's impossible. And so this goes with the last point here. When you meet Christ, you send out light wherever you go. If you know the Lord and you belong to Him, then you send out His light 
wherever you go. Just like Moses did when he was in the presence of the Lord, he came back and his face was shining. And everybody was kind of spooked by that. When, when you and I, when we follow Jesus, it's impossible for us to not be changed by that. It's impossible for us to not shine light. We, we can't. We, we, we do. It always happens. And some will be threatened by it. Some will be encouraged by it. But everyone will be affected by it. So, you and I, as believers following Jesus... We send out Christ's light when we live like him despite what others do. That's what it means to shine Christ's light. Or at least that's maybe one way to describe it. There's some examples. We, we send out Christ's light when we're like him, no matter what other people do. So when we are kind, when others are harsh, that is sending forth his light. When we are patient, when others are in a rush... That is sending forth the light of Christ. When we are peaceful when others are raging, that is Christ's light. Being truthful when others are preferring the deception, that is sending out Christ's light. Being joyful when others are despairing, that is the light of Christ. Being generous when others are stingy, that is the light of Christ. Being holy when others sin, that is the light of Christ. And it's impossible to know Christ... And to experience his grace and to have faith in him without showing this. It's impossible. And we might not do it perfectly, for sure, but there will be a change. We will start to show these things. If you know Christ, you will start to show these things. It's impossible not to. And so, the final thought for you today, let's let our light shine before others. As Jesus himself told us to do, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Knowing Christ is to shine the light of Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for for becoming one of us so that we can have access to your Father as our own Father and get to experience all of the, the wonderful things that you have for us, even though that we are sinners and don't deserve it. Lord, we pray that even as we get to experience who you are, we pray that we would be changed. And that light would shine through all of us as we go about our day in a dark world that uh, doesn't know you. Lord, we pray that we would know you more each day to know all of the good things that you provide for us and to shine this light that you have shown us too. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing now, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory to the newborn King. Jesus is the one who brings us light and peace and hope. We are going to sing about that even as the angels did. 277 in the celebration hymnal, three verses. Let's stand and let's sing together.
The coming of Jesus means that we have many reasons to sing because our Lord offers us everything that our hearts desire. Let's live that out and shine that light this week. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.